Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, everybody. William Harris here, founder and CEO of Element and the host of this podcast where I feature experts in the DDC industry, sharing strategies on how to scale your business and achieve your goals. So real quick, before we get into the meat of the topic, I do want to announce our uh, sponsorship. This is sponsored by Element. Element is uh, our advertising agency and we help uh, e-commerce stores optimize around profit instead of just top line revenue. Uh, we've actually helped 13 of our customers get acquired. The largest one sold for about $800 million. And Adweek recently ranked us as the 12th fastest growing agency in the world. Uh, that's uh, Element spelled E-L-U-M-Y-N-T dot com if you want to check it out. Uh, that said, on to the good stuff. I'm real excited about the guest that I have here today. I have Chris Carey. He is the former founder and CEO of Modern Automotive Performance. He spent 15 years building and growing that, had a successful exit. Now you're an angel investor, general manager at Traction Capital, which is a hybrid PEVC firm. Um, so much that I've been able to learn from Chris, uh, actually have worked with Chris, uh, now for a number of years. And so consider him uh, a personal friend beyond that. Chris, I'm excited to have you here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Um, I was thinking about who introduced us and, and more recently it was Shane Erickson. So I want to give him a shout out as well. But I think if we go back for, further than that, it was Andrew, uh, Udarian over in uh, Chicago after an IRC event, maybe back in like 2018 or something like that. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, it does. I, 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 uh, the internet retailer conference was a great resource for us. And I remember a little happy hour mingle session afterwards. I don't know if you and I really connected, but I think you connected, uh, more so with my brother, Dan, who was my, uh, VP of marketing at my, my previous business. So. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and ran into Dan, you know, it's funny, ran into him a number of times. I think one of our customers, uh, was your next door neighbor there uh, as well. We were uh, doing a lot of stuff with resorts and lodges. And I remember coming oh, and yeah. meeting them and seeing your sign. And I was like, oh my gosh, like you guys are everywhere. It was just really funny. Like all the connections that led to things over the years before we finally started working together. But uh, I, uh, I'm excited to dig into uh, a few things with you. Um, I, I almost kind of want to go from like start to finish because I think that there's a really fun introduction to uh, building the company, but then also the exit, which I feel like is something that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, let's start at the beginning, though. Uh, what made you decide that you were going to start, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times we call it MAP. Like what, what made you start Modern Automotive Performance? Um, I guess the the main premise, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know exactly what it, what it is. There wasn't a an individual or a catalyst, so to speak, that uh, made me go down this path. But it was something along the lines of not wanting to work for the man anymore. <clears throat> um, my sure. previous experience was in in consumer electronics, and I worked at Circuit City, and then a third party wireless retailer within Best Buy locations, and eventually made the leap to Verizon Wireless, selling wireless phones. And um, one of the things that I remember from that experience were these 6 a.m. Uh, disciplinary meetings where if we didn't hit our sales numbers for the week or the month or whatever it was, the management would have us come in at 6 a.m. and uh, and kind of do a a rally, I guess, try to rally the troops and get us to, to hit our numbers. Um, but for me, it had the the complete opposite effect. I am not sure. a morning person by any stretch of the imagination, so I would have to drive a half hour to the Verizon Wireless store at 6 a.m., stay there for an hour meeting, come home, get a few more hours of sleep in, and then go work my 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. shift there. So it basically took up my entire day. And uh, oh. it really just got me thinking, you know, there's got to be, there has to be something better than this that I can do. And uh, I guess I was going to school for business at the University of Minnesota at the time. And I, again, I can't really pinpoint exactly what made me think, hey, you should start your own business. But um, I just really like the idea of being my own boss and being able to set my own hours. Um, not fully understanding that I would then end up working 60, 70, 80 hour weeks, but at least it was on my own volition. Um, and yep. I could, uh, could sleep in a little bit longer. So yeah, that was kind of the, the catalyst for it. I, uh, I love where you're going with that because I feel like a lot of times, you know, I'm obviously uh, an entrepreneur as well. And, and there is this idea where you're just like, Hey, I can't wait to like be my own boss, make my own rules, set my own hours. And, and it's very quick in a business and starting your own company that you realize that you're like, you know, I've, I think I've heard people say you trade in your nine to five for a nine to nine, seven days a week kind of thing. And that's uh -huh. very true for a lot of us. Yep. Yeah. Fortunately, it feels, uh, it feels different. You know, you don't feel like you have to yes. go in, you want to go in and that's a, uh, that's a much better true. feeling. So. 
Yeah. So now, okay. So that's why you started a business in general, but, but why this one, what attracted you to, you know, car parts? Were you a car guy in the first place? Yeah, this was my, my hobby, my passion at the time. So I guess I had, there was two things in mind. I was going to go either one direction or the other. The first um, being a third party wireless phone retailer, is that was the, what I knew and where I was working. Um, and then the other, my hobby, my passion uh, again, was in the automotive aftermarket. I had a 1995 Mitsubishi Eclipse and this was uh, right around the nice. time and a little, little hat tip to the Fast and the Furious movie franchise. Um, but I had yep. a, a 1995 Mitsubishi Eclipse that I was modifying. A friend of mine had a 1995 Ford Mustang and it was kind of a, a, a game, a competition who could modify their car, whose was faster. Um, and that one just had simply had a lower barrier of entry. I had a friend at the time that was doing sure. some website design and I, uh, you know, it's very low cost for me to have him spin up a, a website for me. I actually bought some inventory. Um, on my personal credit card, put it in my closet in my townhouse at the time. Um, and yeah, so I guess ultimately it was, it was that it was the barrier of entry in order to do a third party yep. wireless retailer. I would have had to have rented a retail space, got licensing agreements with the specific carriers, um, just more of a headache. So this, this was the, the easier route and it, uh, aligned with my passion at the time. And, um, fortunately it worked out. There's something to be said for just figuring out like where where do your passions already align and how, what is the door, whether it's open or closed to be able to move through things. Because to a, to a point, whenever you start a business, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And if you can find something that you already enjoy, a passion of yours anyways, that at least makes enduring some of the, the long hours or weekends or whatever that might be uh, a little bit easier. Um I, uh, I know and you talked about, you know, putting this on your personal credit card at first too. And I, I know some guys who did that too. They started a business and, um, I want to say for the longest time, you know, maybe, maybe a decade later, they still had everything running through their personal credit cards and, you know, mm -hmm. e-commerce store, maybe doing 10 figures a year. And the, you know, the amount of amount of stuff that was going on in their personal cards was, was wild. Did that ever make you nervous at all? Uh, certainly. And I guess the, the thing that made me more nervous, so I started it, that bit of inventory was with my personal credit card when we actually decided to, excuse me, uh, lease a physical space. Um, we were to start to, uh, a friend of mine was working on, uh, uh, his name's Kyle. He was a co-founder, was working on vehicles out of his garage, had some history in the automotive aftermarket. We just started joking around. How about you work on the cars? I will sell the parts and um, we'll kind of see if we can make something of this. And so we ended up leasing, uh, I want to say it was like a 2,500 or 3,000 square foot warehouse space. So at that point in time, I had to sign on the dotted line, you know, and there was a personal guarantee to that. Um, sure. I really had no idea. I, I think I was very naive to what could have gone wrong. You know, if we weren't able to fulfill that obligation, it would have all been hung on me at the time. Um, but also my mom had a credit card with a $30,000 line of credit. And that's how we furnished the space. That's how we bought our first sure. lifts, our first desks, our first computers, things along those lines. So that was more um, stressful, you know, in regards to paying off my own credit card, that's one thing, but paying off my mom's credit card and not wanting sure. to let her down, I think was certainly, um, you know, a motivating factor. And I, I, I still feel very fortunate to have been in the position where my parents were able to support me in that matter. Um, yeah. you know, starting a business. So it helps to have somebody in your corner a little bit, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then again, it was, it was served as a motivating force. Like, you know, you don't want to, I don't want to let my mom down here. I got to make this thing work. So yeah. yeah, you still, yeah, it's a, you know, bad business deal with a bad partner. It's like, you kind of go your separate ways, but you have a bad business deal with your mom and it's like, you still got to see her at Christmas and Easter and whatever else. Right. So yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, so, okay. You guys eventually, you know, continued to grow though. And, and I think that you went beyond just third party selling, but you, you actually started developing and producing your own parts as well. Right. Like what was the motivation behind creating your own line and brand? Um, we just kind of stumbled into it, to be honest with you. Like we would, so at one point we, we started drop shipping and there was a lot of the initial orders volume that we had where we wouldn't see the product at all. It would go straight to the customer. Sure. Um, and then we got to the point where for various reasons, we would start to bring product into whether we were ordering it for a car that we were working on in our facility, or we were trying to compile an order to ship internationally. We started to see a lot of things come through our facility and my co-founder Kyle at the time, you know, he would, he would very, I mean, he just eats, sleeps and breathes cars. That's his whole life. And so he would be interested in every part that came through and he'd be looking at him. He'd be like, you know what? I could make this. And I'm like, what do you sure. mean you could make this? Like if I had, I've got a welder, we just need this, you know, 
pipe cutter, bandsaw, whatever, whatever. Like, I can, I could make something like this if we ever wanted to do that. And I think, you know, the, the, uh, the, the catalyst for us making a lot of products were when we ran into a, um, manufacturer that was kind of smallish and was unable to meet the demand, uh, of the market. So we would be trying to buy 10, 20, 30 of this piece. And they're like, no, we, we can't do that. It's, or, or it's going to be three months, six months, what, you know, whatever mm-hmm. it is. And so the, the demand from the market had outpaced what their ability was to supply it. And we're like, we can make this. Why don't yeah. we just make our, uh, you know, a version of it? Um, and so we would look to, you know, how can we add value as well? How can we make this thing better when we're making our variation of it or higher quality or, you know, what have you? Or do we see opportunities to reduce costs? But so that was really the catalyst. We would see things come through the door. He's like, I know that I can make that. We have the equipment to do it. And then all of a sudden we ran into a situation where we had a ton of demand from our customers. They weren't able to fill the demand. And uh, we looked at that as an opportunity to start our own product line. That's brilliant because I guarantee when you first started the e-commerce business here, you didn't think, hey, one day I'm going to make my own products, right? You're just like, great, I'm going to sell these other products. But you had the at least the flexibility of saying, what's happening and how can I use what's happening to my advantage? Yeah, certainly we didn't go into it. Um, I mean, and it's funny to look back at, I, I never would have imagined it had grown to the scale that it did be- before I sold it or where it even is today. Um, but yeah, yeah, we certainly didn't go into it thinking we were going to manufacture products either. And I think one of our um, best traits or competitive advantages was just con- con- excuse me, <clears throat> consolidation of the supply chain. Um, so we would look at these opportunities, you know, hey, we can make that in-house cut out this, you know, we were the middleman, I guess, but we could b- reduce one step in the supply chain or, or one cog yep. in the wheel and, um, re- you know, improve margins for ourselves, lower costs for the consumer. Um, so it was something that, that became natural for us. And then same thing, as we went down the line, we would still outsource some pieces of manufacturing, for instance, like CNC machining mm-hmm, or, mm-hmm. um, lathes and mills and things like that. And at, over time, as we got more comfortable with manufacturing, we started to bring that equipment in house and just consolidate that supply chain into our own facility that uh, again, allowed us to improve margins, reduce costs, better control the quality of the final product. Um, yeah. So I would say that was really um, um, a big part of our success was that supply chain consolidation and how we were able to bring a, a lot of things in house over time. And, and again, control the quality throughout the whole process. So. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, something that I've heard from a lot of VCs and, and and maybe even it may have been Shane Erickson at one point in time, too. But don't quote me on for sure if he's the one who told me this. But uh, one of the biggest things that investors oftentimes are looking for in earlier stage businesses, not for the, from an acquisition standpoint, um, but is a founder who has that ability to pivot. Because oftentimes, whatever you start doing, you're going to need to find ways that you're going to change from what your original, you know, go to market plan was when you set it out from, you know, month one, uh, or whatever that was. And it sounds like you had that ability to be able to say, great, we see this opportunity. Let's let's move on to this as well. And I think we just got very lucky in that regard. We didn't, so we didn't have, and I know we're going to talk about EOS at some point and yeah. setting a, you know, a longer term vision, but we didn't have any idea what we were doing. I mean, we were just riding the wave, um, the, the way we got traction in the early days. So, so we grew pretty rapidly, um, between 2007 and 2010, we grew from 968,000 to almost 9.8 million that landed us wow. at number 403 on the Inc 500 list of fastest growing privately held Congrats. companies in America. Um, but it was all just by providing what today is like the standard of customer service. Sure. Like in 2007, 2010, like it just, people wouldn't answer the phone. People wouldn't respond to your emails. <laughs> you couldn't get tracking yeah. numbers. I mean, these things sound silly today. Um, but all, that's all we did. We just picked up the phone. We were kind, we were knowledgeable. We provided the information that the customer was looking for. And then they went and told all of their friends. And so it was, yeah. we didn't do any paid marketing, I think for the first five, six, seven, eight years we were in business. We didn't have to. Wow. There was, the word of mouth was um, so tremendous that that all of that growth came from just word of mouth and providing what we called exceptional customer service, which mm-hmm. obviously changed throughout the years. But um, yeah, that's kind of how we, we rode that growth train. So. I think there's something that's still true for that today, though, in being able to listen and be aware of what is the market looking for in terms of customer service, because that is that is a really good way for people to stand out. Um, it, it, an example here, Sweetwater, and I'll I'll throw them out here. 
Uh, I'm a musician. I order a whole lot of uh, music equipment and things like that. I mean, even right, you know, I've got my mic here. You know, I've got the uh, Shure 55 SH Series 2. I've got my Rodecaster Pro 2 here and I've got my ATEM Mini Pro. And like, I've got all kinds of gear and hardware, but I need to make sure that it all fits and works together. And what's interesting about Sweetwater is the way that they go about this is, you know, if you if you have a question about it, this is obviously complex stuff. You could jump right on and like a phone call with somebody like pre-sales and help walk through this. And and then as soon as you buy it, like I get a text from like the same guy every time. It's like it's like my guy there. Right. And he's like, hey, just check and make sure you've got everything that you need. You need any help setting it up. It's like we can walk you through some of the setup and troubleshoot anything. And it's like that's next level customer service. And a lot of people don't provide and a lot of businesses can't provide it. Right. This is a higher expensive, you know, higher touch type uh, product. But. I think that they continue to set the the standard above and beyond what I see a lot of other websites doing. So there's ways that businesses can still focus on doing a better job with customer service right now too. Absolutely, and that that was another. I talked about having knowledgeable people on the other end of the phone. That was how we staved off Amazon yeah. and the other types of competitors. Like, sure, if you knew exactly what you wanted, you didn't have any question at all, and the only thing you cared about was price. Maybe Amazon's a good fit for you, um, but sure. for our higher ticket products, our average order value was, I don't know, somewhere in the $400 range. Um, and there was a lot of concern as to what, will this part work for with this part? Well, is this the right part for my submodel right. of car? Um, and so it was very important to have someone that our customers could reach out to that knew the answer to those questions or could go find it. And so, yeah, having that high touch, knowledgeable individual that can answer the questions that Amazon customer service is never going to be able to, right. to answer right. um, was really one of our, our main differentiators, especially when you talk about a lot of um, the product lines in our industry had a minimum advertised price when the mm -hmm. prices or, or when the playing field is level in terms of price. And now all we're competing on is customer service or website ease of use, um, yep. you know, things like shipping speed, et cetera. That's where we felt like we had an advantage over most people because we had gotten to uh, a point in in our scale, we had some economies of scale in terms of our avi inventory availability. We had a really well run warehouse operation, so we're able to ship very quickly. Um, yeah, that became an advantage for us. We we loved it when the playing field was level in regards to price. So, yeah, well, in in okay, so let's let's fast forward here a little bit. So you're you're doing these things, and it's helping the business grow. And you know, I, I want to say it's eight years in you guys on Inc. 5000. And, and like you said, you're in like, you know, 400 spot or whatever. Um, but then things stalled out a little bit and you you ran mm -hmm. into a little bit of uh, stalled growth, kind of getting frustrated. How did you break through that plateau? Because I feel like a lot of businesses get there. They get to maybe whatever that plateau is, the 1 million mark, the 10 million mark, and they can't break free. How did you how did you fix that? Yeah, for us it was at 10 million. So right after that, um, you know, year that landed us on the Inc. 500, we celebrate, we're happy. Um, we hit a, a pretty significant period uh, where we hit the ceiling, so to speak. So that was, yeah. I think, three years of trying to get through the 10 million revenue barrier. And this is basically where I believe our inexperience in regards to business operations really caught up with us. I mean, for you know, said for those first several years, we were able to just ride the wave. Um, and if the phone's ringing, you answer it. If an email comes in, you respond. If there's a fire over here, you put it out. If there's a fire over sure. there, you put it out. Um, and it didn't matter who did it. And there were no assigned roles or accountability. It just everybody did everything. And we just made it work. And uh, you just kept throwing people at it. And that, um, as we kind of alluded to here, at about 10 million, I think we were at maybe 30 people at that point, somewhere in that range. Um, it really, that did not work any any longer in regards to allow us to, to continue to scale the business. So uh, I got very frustrated and this is the point where I, I didn't know any other business owners. I, I mentioned earlier, I didn't know any when I started the business. Sure. I hadn't really met anyone throughout the the first um, several years of my journey here. I just had my head down and I, I was grinding and, you know, doing my thing. Um, for some reason, as I, as we had stalled at about 10 million in sales, I decided I was going to reach out to the other Minnesota companies that were on the Inc. 500 in 2011. So there was Smart. eight of them. I didn't know what the purpose of it was or what I was going to get out of it, um, nor why I even decided to reach out. But uh, so I, I reached out just via email to the the eight founders that were on that list. Two responded, I believe, and uh, okay. only one ever actually met with me and we formed kind of a relationship. Um, 
And uh, that gentleman was Andrew Dunneman, who I think you know now uh, yep. from Bulk Reef Supply, which is another, uh, that was a company he previously owned and sold and um, uh, in the e-commerce space as well. So so we got yep. along, uh, we attended IRCE a couple of times and crossed paths there. We had lunch a few times and um, I reached out to him finally after I was just banging my head against the wall with this this challenge at 10 million. I'm like, because I, I had known he had grown past that. And I'm like, sure. what do you attribute your continued success to? And so he brought me up to his office. We had lunch and he's like, I think it's these two things. And the two things he shared with me was one, uh, a local entrepreneurial group called Entrepreneurs Organization. Mm -hmm. And then two, a something called the Entrepreneurial Operating System or EOS based on the book Traction by Gina Whitman. Yep. So it was a, you know, and, and he went on to espouse the values of having a peer group, um, networking with other entrepreneurs that have been there, done that and learning from their experience rather than trial and error, which is what I was doing. If I had an idea, sure. I would go try it. I would spend time. I would spend money. If it didn't work, go back to the drawing board, start all over again. And that took a lot of time to go through each iteration. Um, so, uh, you know, sharing the value of an entrepreneur group that can, can not give advice, but help guide me from their experience on where I should mm -hmm. go and potentially save me time and money. And then EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system is something that I share with almost any entrepreneur that I come across. Um, it's just a simple set of tools and processes to run a business. And I, I can't imagine running a business without them now. And I think most yeah. people that are running successful businesses, even if they don't know of EOS, are probably have some semblance of these tools or processes within their business, whether it's a sure. scorecard and they're tracking five, 10 KPIs over here, or they've got goals are they annual goals? Are they operating in a 90 day world and have a quarterly goals or rocks? Um, an accountability chart. Sure. Most, most large organizations probably have an org chart. Are they going so far to, to, uh, identify mm -hmm. what the accountability is for each member on there? But these, the, it just gave me a playbook, you know, a set of tools and on how to run a business. And so when, after I met with Andrew, I decided, you know, if it, these things worked for him, there's at least chance they would work for, for us. So I joined, EO. I've been a member of that for, I think, going on nine years now. And we uh, engaged with an EOS implementer. And it took probably about 18 months for us to get traction, so to speak, sure. um, with with the tools and with the, the peer group. But then we started that growth engine all over again. It went from 10, 10, 10 to 11, 15, 21, 27, 33. Um, and we were right back uh, riding that wave. So it was pretty another pretty exciting period of time for the, the business. So. Yeah, I love that. And and if you were going to pinpoint, you know, there's a lot of pieces within, let's start on traction first. A lot of, lot of pieces within there. Like you said, the scorecards, RPS, right? Right person, right seat. And there's a lot of pieces to it. If you were going to pinpoint the ones that you felt made the biggest difference to unlocking that growth, what was it? Within the EOS framework? Yeah, within the EOS framework. I would say, I mean, it's it's hard to say which one specifically. I guess I can tell you that um, the process component, documenting processes, was probably further on down the road. The sure. there the big one. So there's tools within the VTO, the Vision Traction Organizer, where you set a ten year big hairy audacious goal. You've got a mm -hmm. three year picture where you want to give just enough detail so someone can like envision it in their mind's eye. You get down to one year goals. You get down to ninety day rocks. Um, we had not ever set goals before. I mean, everyone was just putting out fires. That was all that we did sure. every day. Like, oh, I think I should do that. I think I should do that. We didn't have any meeting cadence. I didn't even mention that. So having sure. a fixed weekly cadence for meetings and the structure to a meeting, which EOS calls a level 10 meeting, then having a fixed structure for a quarterly meeting to reassess our performance from the previous quarter, set goals yeah. for the next quarter, determine rocks and highest priorities for our team, um, I, I would say that that was it. So it's probably between the rocks and the goal setting, the L10 meeting cadence, which allowed yep. us to, to, you know, keep track of where we were at and um, adjust on the fly, as you were talking about earlier. Uh, and then also the scorecard. I mean, before yeah. we implemented EOS, I think we were looking at like daily revenue was like the one KPI that we were looking at. Uh, we never sure. looked at margin. We rarely looked at overhead. We never, we didn't have anything on the manufacturing side of things. So um, being able to create a scorecard of 5, 10, 15 of the most important KPIs that we then reviewed in that weekly meeting. And if they went off track, we would then move over to the issues list and discuss, I think was just, 
and it seems so obvious now when I'm, when I'm saying it now, it seems so obvious, sure. but we just had no idea that this is how a business should be run or could be run. And um, yeah, that made, I mean, just added so much value to the enterprise. Well, and, and I can, I can relate to that in some way too. You know, we've implemented EOS uh, at Element and uh, it, it, one of the biggest game changers for me in implementing that is to your point, the, uh, the, the vision side of this, being able to actually even uh, articulate what the vision is in a very clear way allows everybody on the team to get on the same page, to know what to do from there. They know how they fit within that vision, how they can help execute, how they can row in the boat towards the same goal. And it, it does make everything that much more efficient. Um, I, I, it just, it, it shocked me how much of a difference setting that meant, because I would say that I actually felt like, you know, oh, this stuff is just, you don't need to set that. Obviously, like our goal is just like, be the number one agency, like, duh, this is an easy thing to do. Just like, go do it. Like just, uh, you know, what's the, the model, you know, just get it done kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. but it, it makes a difference to have that, you know, articulated and clearly, uh, visible for people. For sure. And I love that analogy about, uh, everyone rowing in the same direction. Cause if you flip it on its head and you envision everyone rowing sure. in opposite directions, um, sure. that's where I think we were when we got stuck at the 10 million point, I think everybody yeah. had their idea of what they should be doing and where we should be going and they weren't necessarily aligned. And so one person would be moving over here, the other would be moving the opposite direction. And these things were at odds and there wasn't any alignment on where we wanted to go. And I think that was a, a huge reason for our kind of stagnation. Yeah. So, okay. So let's shift over to EO for a minute then. What about EO set it apart as the thing that really helped you to unlock that growth? Like the meetings are like obviously talking about things, but they're not giving you exact advice. So, so how did that help? Well, I mean, so certainly there are within entrepreneurs organization, the chapter itself and, and the region and global do learning events. So I mean, the caliber of some of the speakers that have been brought in throughout my nine years uh, have been exceptional. So there's absolutely sure. learning um, opportunities that I've taken advantage of and so much value that I've taken away from those. But uh, the core uh, of EO is something called the forum experience, which is where you're generally between six and 10 individuals in your forum. You meet monthly for approximately four hours, and there's a specific structure where you share from your experience as an entrepreneur. Um, and it goes beyond business as well. It's also personal and family, but sharing from your experience and being able to have a, a sounding board. So, I mean, you can yeah. ask for advice and certainly I've done that on several occasions. You know, here, here's a challenge that I'm encountering and uh, there's not much experience to speak to it, but I just want to hear what you guys have to say, because I think you're pretty smart. Um, but most of the sure. time it is something, you know, one of the reasons I didn't have a network beforehand was like, no one's going to know the world of automotive aftermarket car parts. Like who, who's right. going to be able to help me with that? And what I didn't realize is everyone has finance and, and cash mm. and everyone has human resources and employees yeah. and everyone has operations and the need to, to document processes and all of these things. And, uh, you know, marketing sales are within every business. Yeah. And yeah. so what I didn't realize is like, sure, the 10% of my niche, maybe they're not going to be able to speak to, but if I have a finance problem or an HR problem, you need to hire someone, fire someone, whatever it is, they have all been there, done that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, someone either had a tremendous resource for me to look into, whether it was a book um, or a, an individual, uh, you know, a, a, an agency, a contractor that could help me with whatever that challenge was at the time. Um, and these were all things that, again, if it was just me in my little yeah. bubble, I would have had to like go Google search. Maybe I found something, maybe I didn't, um, and then try something. And if it failed again, time and money wasted, come back to the drawing board, do it all over again. So yeah. I really, it, it's hard to put a value on that experience, but I, I mean, it ha it has to have saved me. It, it's gotta be into the hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point and, and just sure. hours upon hours of time, you know, not having to go through my previously the only thing that I knew, which was this trial and error, um, make my best guess, go and, and come back to the drawing board if it didn't work. So um, the value of learning from the experience of other entrepreneurs that have been on their own journey, but have experienced things that are relevant to what I'm, uh, you know, potentially struggling with has been invaluable. And, and to your point, there's a lot that can come from like the practical advice uh, that's going to be a part of this. But there's also like the the intangible aspect of like, 
the emotional camaraderie that exists with uh, this as well, because as CEOs, it can be very tough. I had uh, Robert Gilbreth, uh, he was the former CMO over at ShipStation. I had him on a podcast and, and his podcast turned into mostly about why being the CEO is the loneliest job in the world. And I think a lot <laughs> of people can relate to this who have been in that position where, um, you know, it's tough. Uh, and if you don't have uh, people that you can go to with this, where let's just say like mom and dad, well, if they weren't entrepreneurs, if they weren't, weren't building a business, they they can't relate in the same way. Or, you know, even though she's you're using her credit card um, in, in, in brothers and sisters and whoever. Right. And so it's like having a group of people that you can talk to about like the emotional struggles. Is that something yes, that you had uh, that you found value of? Was, was there anything that like you struggled with as a CEO? Oh, oh, absolutely. And that's the thing is, you know, I think it, when people are on the outside looking in and like, oh, you own your own business, it, it appears to be successful. Look at all the people that you have. Look sure. at the building that you have, this amount of inventory. Sure. Have you seen my our financials and all the debt? You know, and, and sure. by the way, I'm personally, it's personally guaranteed. And just last week, I was up all night worried about how I was going to make payroll because yeah. I over-invested inventory here or we're uh, over on expenses in terms of payroll. Things are softening. We've got too much staff, whatever it might be. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very hard to share those things, you know, with people in the corporate world that that you know aren't, um, uh, I guess, privy to the the inner workings of of our business or a business in general. I mean, it's not all sunshine and rainbows for sure. Right. Um, you know, ultimately, I was able to get to the point where I sold the business. Um, and that was a, a great outcome, and, and very grateful to to be in that position. But I mean, yeah, there are so many ups and downs um, throughout the journey, and to have other people to share that with that know what that's like or have been in that same situation or can at least envision that that type of situation, um, I think was very validating um, to know that you're not you know going through it alone, and that you have yeah. other people that are. Are with you to support you and uh you know genuinely care about your success as well was was pretty cool so yeah and and maybe i'm gonna pry too much on this so you tell me if it's not a topic that we want to talk about but like i think you you struggled a little bit even let's just say being an entrepreneur from a physical standpoint as well right yeah and that's um it, it's something that snuck up on me uh over about a 10-year period i mean you know i think yeah. it's the, maybe the uh the frog in boiling water analogy, like sure. if, it, if it had happened right away, I would have been, been so obvious. But over time, um, I mean, what I did was sales and marketing. I mean, I sat in front of a computer, I picked up phones. That was my my role. And that's where I needed to be to ensure the business was successful. So I'd go yeah. into work, sit in front of a desk for eight, nine, 10 hours, come home. And I left very little time to take care of myself physically. Mm -hmm. I mean, the time that I did have, I wanted to spend with my wife and daughters um, you know, outside of, of the workplace. So I just completely dropped the ball in terms of my physical fitness. I was not, um, well-versed in terms of food and nutrition and what I should be eating and what was good for me, bad for me, et cetera. Um, and it really just took a toll over time. So my, my twenties, yep. I think I started out in a pretty good spot. Um, and then throughout my twenties into my early thirties, uh, it just really deteriorated. I got up to about 270 pounds, I think, at the peak. And if you look at some of my wedding photos or some, some, uh, photos from, from towards the end of that journey, I mean, it's, it's night and day difference, um, between then and now, but there was, uh, yeah, I definitely lost sight of what was important in regards to my physical health. Um, as I was just kind of, you know, like I said, had my head down grinding and trying to make the business work. And so I feel like this is something that's all too true to most CEOs. Uh, we can all relate to that. I've got my own version of that as well. Um, do you, I, I, I actually tell people that there's almost, it's almost a rite of passage. I'm not saying that you, you have to do that in order to be successful, <laughs> but I would say that it's almost going to be inevitable if you're too balanced too early on to get to the point where you can be uh, great at this one other thing. And, and even just going back to, let's just say, uh, Olympians, right? It's like, if, if you're going to be the absolute number one or the best at something in whatever it is, your respective field, you're likely going to be unbalanced in some other area of life. It's almost a necessity to a point, but then there needs to be a point where you have like this, you know, awakening and you say, okay, I got to get things back in order. Um, what was the awakening moment for you where you said, okay, wow, like here I am and I need to change something. And how did you change that? 
Yeah, I guess I it really hit me one day. So I have two daughters. Uh, they're now 15 and 11. And I was my oldest at the time, I want to say was maybe five, because I'm thinking this was about 10 years ago. Um, so she was five or six and I was carrying her up. We have two very small flights of stairs up to the to her bedroom. And at the top of the stairs, I was like sweating profusely. I was winded. I had to take a break. Yeah. And I'm like, this isn't right. Like I should not yeah. be at, you know, 30 years old at the time. I should not be, you know, this exhausted <laughs> from just carrying her up the stairs. And um, I guess a, a little more backstory. My father uh, has had several heart issues. So he had a triple bypass. Mm. He had a heart attack um, prior to that. And so it's been kind of top of mind for me. But, you know, one of the things I, I guess I realized at that point in time is I want to be around for my daughter to to grow up and to graduate high school and get her first job and get married, buy a house. Maybe I have grandchildren someday. And I was on, uh, it just kind of hit me at that point that I was on a bad path. Um, and that that isn't, you know, a guarantee and I'm going to need to work for it. And this was actually all around the same time. So I, I joined EO. We uh, engaged with an EOS implementer. I started to open myself up to reading and absorbing mm. knowledge through, uh, you know, whether physical books or audio books. And that was something I had never done either. And, and I, I don't know what the catalyst was for that, where I'm like, oh, I, maybe I can learn something from you know, these people that took their time to to put all of their thoughts into, you know, book form for me to consume mm -hmm. 10, 100 years later, whatever it might be. Um, but I, I call this kind of my enlightenment period, like, you know, whatever yeah. it was, I, I was, I was opened up to a peer group, I was opened up to an operating system for businesses, I started to, to read books and consume content, and grow as an individual. And um, for whatever reason, you know, at that point, when I experienced this kind of physical, uh, um, you know, awakening, uh, carrying my daughter up the stairs, uh, I decided it was time for me to, to do something about that as well. And, and began, a uh, about an 18 month weight, weight loss journey where I was able to shave about 70 pounds off and, and get closer to the 200 pound mark, wow. which is, uh, much more comfortable and, uh, feel, feels a lot better now. So. Yeah. Good for you. Um, I had to laugh when you were talking about like, you know, reading a book finally. And, and, you know, it's like, it reminds me of, uh, LeVar Burton's, uh, reading rainbow, right? It's in a book. <laughs> Take a look, reading. <laughs> um, and, and it just reminds me of just the the importance of there are so many of the answers to the things that we're looking for have maybe already been discovered. And sometimes as entrepreneurs, we are answer answer figure outers or whatever I want to call that, right? We like to figure out the answers to problems versus just hear from somebody else what the answer was to a problem. Uh, and we almost find joy out of trying to figure it out ourselves. Um, and so, but rather than reinventing the wheel and saying, well, okay, Hey, circle's been used for a really long time. Let's start there and iterate from there, but let's, let's call upon some of this knowledge that existed before. What book or books, uh, did you find particularly helpful for you in that early stage? Well, traction is the big one, obviously, right? So as soon as sure. as soon as Andrew shared that with me, I read traction. Um, but that's more of a you know, it's just outlining the tools and the systems um, within EOS. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think what I mean. So, so one that comes to mind right away: How to Win Friends and Influence People by yeah. Dale Carnegie. Um, you know, these are things as I'm reading it, and another is the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. That these yep. are things that, in my opinion, should have been taught in high school. Like, why did 100%. I not read this book? I don't understand. Like everyone can benefit from, you know, learning some of these concepts and, and how to interact with people, how to influence people, how to, um, you know, just, just be a successful, uh, productive human being. Um, you know, those were, those were two of the big ones beyond that. Um, I'm trying to think what else is top. I've got a, on my website, <laughs> I actually have a list of my, my top 22 books and I'm trying to think there are other business specific ones over time. Um, multipliers was a really good one that, mm. that I, uh, really enjoyed. I think that's Liz Wiseman potentially. Um, what else is up there? I got into stoicism. So you have, totally. um, what is it? The daily? Yeah. Where is it? Tell oh yeah. What is this? Uh, uh, Ryan. Uh, it's right? Ryan holiday. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Daily stoic maybe. So, um, yep. every day for 365 days, I'd read a stoic passage. So I got into Marcus Aurelius. Yep. Um, never could get yeah. into meditations, uh, directly, but I always loved, you know, Ryan's, uh, interpretation of it. So, um, yep. yeah, I think those are a couple of the, the big ones. Oh, um, 
and then if you want to get tactical, so getting things done by David Allen, like I, just yeah. how to, you know, I, I have an in tray now and sure it's electronic versus paper, um, but just how to, how to get things done, how to keep yourself organized. And that's, yep. I, I guess I'm a, I'm a bit of an organization and productivity nerd. So I'll, uh, life Love hacks, it. if you want to call it. So I, I'll, I'll delve into that stuff and just eat it up. But um, yeah, those are some that, that come to mind. Uh, right at the the top of it, top of my list. So those are all excellent. I think I've read uh, just about every one that you uh, mentioned there as well. There's a couple of maybe that I need to, get, and I need to actually go look at the list that you have of uh, all 22. Um, so you know, you found EO, you found EOS, you started reading, and all of these things start moving you towards uh, this growth. Let's move forward into the exit. Then um, that's a whole new level. I imagine. You didn't plan on when you started the business, you didn't say, hey, I'm going to build this and one day sell it, right? Because a lot of people don't. They, they just start the business because they're interested in it. Um, but, but correct me if I'm wrong. Were you When you founded the business, you didn't plan on selling it at that time. Much like we didn't plan on manufacturing, uh, yeah. much like I, I never planned on you know buying my own building and, and, and building an expansion on it. I mean, so many things that weren't planned, like it just never crossed my mind. I guess for me to have thought about selling the business, I would have had thought, had to have thought that it was going to get to the size or scale sure. that it was where someone would actually want to buy it. Um, you know, and like I said, so it was, it was several years into the journey before that had even crossed my mind. And then, um, you know, somewhere, I, I don't know where I heard it, but you know, it, basically I, I was made aware that everyone, every entrepreneur is going to exit their business and are you going to be standing up or lying down? And so mm. that really, resonated with me. You know, is this something that I'm going to take to my grave? Do my kids want to have it? Um, or do I want to be proactive and sell this, you know, um, potentially at its peak in terms of valuation? Mm -hmm. Is this what I want to continue to do with the next chapter of my life? Um, or do I want to move on to something else? So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, these kind of existential questions that I was struggling with and, um, ultimately decided, uh, that the time was right to start to explore a sale. So. Yeah. And so what did you do to prepare the business for being a sellable asset? Were there things that you ran into and you're like, oh, we got to do this or change this or, you know, things that you realize this is necessary for us to really make sure that we we sell the business uh, well? So I um, actually engage with an investment banker. Um, I, I don't know if you know Jake Fishman from Madeira Partners here locally, but uh, he was an EO sponsor at the time. Okay. And we just ran into each other, I think, in an event and started talking. And uh, I think he maybe asked me the question, you know, have you ever thought of selling your business? What's it look like, your your idea of an exit? And that's where we kind of started the conversation. So um, it, it piqued my interest. So I sent over you know, some financials to him, a couple of their data mm -hmm. points. And uh, we kind of realized at that point in time that the numbers weren't going to work out in terms of what I thought would be, you know, a valuation that I could get comfortable with and say, okay, yep. yeah, it's instead of just continuing to run this business and, you know, um, try and make it more profitable, harvest some of those profits, maybe we look at selling and then I can move into, you know, another chapter of my life. But we realized that we were a ways off from that. And so um, that was very informational to me. So I was able to just kind of say, okay, we're we're this far apart. I need to put my head back down, keep grinding, increase revenue, yep. increase margin, reduce overhead, you know, improve the, the net income to get to this target dollar. That's going to lead to potentially this multiple. And that's going to lead to, you know, ultimately the number that I wanted to get to, to make um, exiting the business seem, you know, plausible. So what else did so, you do to help like the book <clears throat> or anything? Well, so there was a, yeah, there was a couple books. And before I said that, I want to just uh, really sure. touch on the fact how helpful EOS was in this whole process. So when we were actually courting potential acquirers, having a scorecard with historical data of performance mm -hmm. of all these key performance indicators, having a VTO where we've, they know what our 10 year goal is, where our three year picture looks like, what our annual goals are, 90 day rocks, having the accountability charge, be like, here's every person on our team, what they're accountable for. I mean, just, we really, um, from the perspective of the buyers had things in order to a degree that they had not seen in other organizations sure. that they evaluated. So um, I think that gave us a really uh, strong competitive advantage um, in regards to finding an acquirer and, and making them comfortable that what we were saying about the business was truthful and they do exactly what they were buying. So um, huge, another huge upside of EOS there. Um, two resources that I found a tremendous amount of value. And so as I decided, uh, decided I was going to sell the business, then I reached out to people in my network that I had known to sell and talked to everybody that I could that had sold the sure. business, trying to learn as much as I could, um, knowing that you know this maybe is something I'm only ever going to do once. 
Um, and maybe most, most entrants probably only go through it once. And so it's, yep. um, there's not a, a, a huge abundance of knowledge or experience share out there on this, but, the, uh, where it is, it, I, I wanted to seek it out and learn from as many people as I could beyond that. <clears throat> Um, I think this is probably another one on my book list, uh, Finish Big by Bo Burlingham. Mm -hmm. It was a huge, um, hugely beneficial to me and, and just a great guide in leading up to, you know, thinking about selling your business, what should you do in preparation for selling your business? And then once you get there and you sell, then what? And there's things you need to sure. consider as an entrepreneur that's had your your identity, your meaning, your structure, yeah. um, you know, in, in one way for the last 15 years. And now all of a sudden uh, a switch flips and it's all all different. So, um, and to build on those three things, I think the, the, the structure, meaning and identity bullet points kind of come from a uh, white paper from the Yale School of Management. And I think it's called, what was it? The entrepreneurs, it's something about post-exit entrepreneurs and uh, the and the dilemma that they face after exiting mm -hmm. their business. Um, maybe we'll have to find it for your your show notes and get the exact name Throw of that white the, paper. But yep. yeah, yeah, that was hugely beneficial as well. And that one really focused primarily on okay, now you've sold your business, what is it going to be like after you sell your business? Why is even that? scenario that, you know, most people will look at as, as, as a huge win and, and, you know, a, com a very positive situation. What are some of the potential pitfalls? What are some of the things that mm -hmm. you're not thinking about as you're, as you're navigating this new chapter of your life without that business that, you know, you built and potentially was your identity, uh, you know, for the last, for me, it was 15 years. So, um, and time. you know, and uh, it, structure as well, you're not getting up and going to the office anymore. You don't have your fixed weekly meeting with your leadership team. You're not seeing the people that I had seen every day yeah. for uh, a decade or more. So um, it was it was quite a big change. And so having, um, again, insight from people that had been there, done that, some of the things that they struggled with and how they ultimately overcame it, um, both through that white paper and then the, the, the book Finish Big was hugely valuable. I've heard that from a number of people. I don't even know if you and I have talked about this. We've helped 13 of our customers get acquired now. And so there's a lot of opportunity wow. that I've had to speak to people about uh, their own feelings of this. And, and to your point, I would say that most of them, the struggle to actually get acquired, you know, whatever, you know, data that needed to happen and structuring it and all the legal stuff uh, pales in comparison to the emotional wear and tear that you have of like, what's next now? Um, mm -hmm. and, that's a that's tough. So for you, what was next? Well, like what like what have you done or what is next? One one thing I want to touch on as you mentioned going through this yeah. journey, the due diligence period. So I as you're going, you know, we've signed the LOI, we're going through all of the the financials, all the data, you know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's. I actually had towards the end of it. So we we signed the LOI, I think, in mid-October, and we were trying to close by December 31st. And as the end of December approached, I started to get, uh, what I guess what they call premature ventricular contractions or PVCs. Like I had yeah. heart palpitations where like my heart would just skip a beat. Jeez. And so I was really concerned. And so I go into the doctor, they do like an echocardiogram and, um, couldn't find anything wrong. And then all of a sudden the, the one of them goes, would you happen to be under any stress at the moment? <laughs> and I had to, had to think to myself, I'm like, wow, I, I guess I am. Uh, yeah, I'm going through this, you know, sale of my business. Everything is falling on me in terms of, yeah. you know, having to to provide them with information or data as it's needed. Um, I didn't realize, you know, we go back to the frog in boiling water types. I didn't realize how much was being asked of me and yeah. how much work and stress um, was on my shoulders at that point in time until, you know, it started to have actual negative repercussions on my physical health because of how yeah. much, uh, how much stress I was under. So that it was something that was uh, you know, another thing we talked about taking care of yourself physically before, um, this is another situation. If you are selling your business, if you are going through deal, due diligence, it can be a lot and just kind of, you know, maybe take a step back and, and take toll of, uh, you know, how much stress you might be under. And, um, for me, love playing ice hockey, love getting out on the golf course. Uh, you know, what can yeah. you do to reduce stress during that time? I mean, it's certainly something to, to be conscious of. So. Well, okay. So let's just chat about playing hockey real quick then and, and the physicality of, of what you're doing there. Um, one of the things that I have often speculated is that 
uh, sometimes we need a real battle. We need a real war. And, and let's just say hockey or something like that, a competitive sport gives you something to fight instead of fighting against, you know, numbers or number crunchers or whatever else might be there because we are warriors. There is something that is in our blood, in our bones that we want. A, we want a little bit of a fight, a little something. And if we don't have that, that competitive uh, outlet, uh, then sometimes we can we can turn that co competition into, uh, let's just say, you know, things within business or, you know, things within our spouses or whatever that might be. Uh, but there's an importance of just, yeah, like you said, get out there, play some hockey, find that that competitive outlet. Yeah. And that's what so you alluded to it earlier. There is no perfect balance. There's going to be a f there's yeah. phases in, in life. And, you know, one one phase might require you to be predominantly focused on your business. And then there would be another phase where you're dealing with some family issues or what have you, and you need to lean into to your family. And that's at the expense of, of, of business or physical, or, you know, sure. taking to yourself personally. And then there's other times where, you know, after I had, had gone down a path for 10 years where I needed to take care of myself physically, I would specifically block off time in the middle of the day to go to the gym, to get a workout in, because it was so important that I got that back in line. Um, I think that if you can, I now see the value of physical exercise <laughs> and how much of an impact that makes on my work product. And had I realized yeah. that at the time, I probably would have blocked off more time to get some physical exercise or movement of some sort because it made me that much more productive mm. um, when I was you know, in front of the desk, in front of the monitor, so. Well, making it a, a rock. And so going to like the EOS metaphor, and it's one of my favorite metaphors. Uh, and I don't know if they started it, but the idea of rocks, right, which is what they, they we talk about a lot in EOS. But you've got mm -hmm. your rocks. And then, it, it, you know, the idea was like a, a vase. And it's like, okay, well, if you put in the water and then the sand and then the pebbles, like there's no room for the rocks, the things that are the most important. But if you put the rocks in first, then the pebbles can sift down through there. The sand can sift down through there. The water can sift down through there. Same amount of material, but it all fits now. And And to your point, you know, not just in business setting up your rocks, but setting up your own personal rocks as well as like a, an individual and a human saying, I need this creative outlet. I need this physical outlet. I need my date nights with my wife. I need this time with my kids, uh, whatever those things. I need time to you know volunteer within my community or my church or whatever that might be, but saying these are the things that are important to me to fill my soul so that way I have that energy, emotional energy to continue moving forward, I think is uh, something that we sometimes forget about as uh, entrepreneurs do. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, and and um, I'd, I'd have to look it up and again, maybe we can find us another resource, but uh, Darren Hardy, I'm a big fan of his. Uh, he does a, uh, the, the Darren Daily video. Um, he's just a, a success coach. I think he started Success Magazine, but one of his tools is kind of a life assessment and it's like mm. rank yourself on how you're doing in terms of business and family, personal, spiritual, um, you know, a, a myriad of other things. And um, just knowing where you're at and is this where you want to be? And sure, right. it's not going to be a third, a third, a third, but do you want to be at 80%, 10%, 10% or would you prefer it to be yeah. 60, 20, 20, um, right. you know, and what do you need to do to make those adjustments? Just, just so just an awareness of where you're allocating your time. Is this where you want to be in this phase of your life or do you need to make some changes? So some sort of a, a tool or system to keep track of I think that that's I think great. is we, hugely valuable. Yeah. We need, we need to link to that then because I think that would be a really great assessment for people to go through. Okay, so jumping back into what is next for you and, and the things that I know are, one, you're doing something new, but you also have a, a, an e-commerce side hustle uh, right now with your wife. And so I think it's just a really fun one. And I want to bring that up as well. Yeah. So what's next for me, um, I guess recently, so I signed on for two years post transaction to work with the organization. Um, that lasted about 16 months before we both decided that it was a uh, mutually beneficial for us to part ways. So that was April of 22, at which okay. point, um, I decided to join Shane Erickson's firm traction capital, which is a hybrid venture capital, private equity fund. And, I guess really the 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 premise there was I wanted to learn more about the space. Um, I guess prior to selling my business, it seemed like an obvious thing that I was just going to start another business, whether I started from sure. scratch or I bought one. Um, and then as I was kind of going through the whole process, I'll, I'll tell you, man, I, I love so many of the people that I met throughout my journey, but it was really nice to not have any employees for a while there. And I didn't yeah. know that I wanted to dive back into running an organization where I would have to hire people and, and um, you know, have a team of people again. So I wanted to, I had done a little bit of angel investing in 2019 and I wanted to just learn more about the venture capital space. And this looked like a great 
opportunity for me to join an established fund who had some really high level individuals and go and, and, and get to learn a little bit more about it. And that's what I've been doing uh, for the past just over a year now is helping with traction. Um, I believe my title is entrepreneur in residence, and that's kind of shifted around a little bit, but I've got three of their portfolio companies under my purview. And I'm just finding that I'm getting a ton of energy out of coaching and mentoring these yeah. early stage entrepreneurs that just have a ton of horsepower. <laughs> and, you know, they are they're, uh where I was, you know, maybe 17, 16, 17 years ago now. And it's so cool to just go back and, and kind of help them navigate some of the challenges that they're encountering uh, at this point in time. Um, so that's been a great experience. And then beyond that, I think within the last year here, uh, my wife actually decided to buy an e-commerce business. And um, I guess I, we don't have to go super far down the rabbit hole, but I live in a household of uh, equine fanatics. So we we love, love horses it. here. And um, my oldest daughter rides competitively. My youngest is getting into it. And actually my wife, Heather, is as well. And um, we, she started to look for a business that was in that, uh, you know, industry. And so uh, she ended up buying a business that makes halters and lead ropes for miniature horses and miniature donkeys. So it's almost like a niche so within a niche, um, yeah. but it's something that she is super excited about. And um, we don't have any miniature horses or miniature donkeys as of yet, but I, I think it's only a matter of time at this point before uh, before we're going to have a new a new member of the family uh, within <laughs> that species. So, um, but she's it took her a little while to get her her feet underneath her, but um, she's got a really good handle on on the business now, and she's very excited to get into full size horses. And that was kind of the idea cool. from the start was you know if we can we have a supplier relationship with someone that can make these for the miniature versions we can certainly make them for the full size as well and uh she's got some some pretty big aspirations for that business so excited to I, support her on that journey i love it when i loved uh when you first told me about it is you know the idea was it's like you went from like one type of horsepower to another type of horsepower which is what i kind of just appreciated <laughs> um mm -hmm. and in the miniature horses uh very tangential has nothing to do with e-commerce at all um i have really bad eyesight uh it's like negative nine uh, is my prescription. And uh, so I, I can't see very well at all. Not quite legally blind, but my wife was asking the one day she was like, well, and we've got, so we've got just about an acre of property right in town here, uh, which is kind of a rare thing. It's like uh, four city lots. And so she was like, well, we've got this fence up there and she really, we've got chickens. We had ducks a little bit. She really wanted a, a horse too. And I said, you can't have a horse in the city. Like it's not enough property. She was like, what about a mini horse? So she was looking around the one time she was like, well, you can get a seeing eye horse apparently uh, if you're blind enough. She was like, how much more blind do you need to get babe in order for us to get a seeing eye horse? And she found one that was like an old retired horse named Tater Tot. So we may end up, who knows, buying a, a miniature horse uh, for my seeing eye horse. And we'll, we'll be buying some leads and stuff from you guys. That sounds great. Yeah, maybe we can set up like a modeling photo shoot or something, get you a little, reimburse you a little bit. So Yeah, yeah great, right. That'd be great. Um, I want to transition uh, real quick into the, uh, just like who is Chris uh, a, a little bit as well. We talked about hockey, we talked about golf, um, but some of the other things that we, we didn't touch too much on, but you kind of hinted at here a little bit is, you know, your family is really important to you and your kids. And, and you told me, one of the most important things uh, that you're looking at for from a parenting perspective for your kids uh, is exercise and reading. And obviously you hinted at reading. Um, tell me more about like what that's like from a parenting perspective. Yeah, for the past, um, I guess, a couple of years now, there's been something in the back of my mind. And, and maybe it came down to that, you know, whole revelation, you know, um, when I went on my kind of weight loss journey is that I'm not going to be here forever. And I want to do whatever I can to try and extend my time you know, on this planet and and be there for my daughters when they need me, but anything can happen. And, and so this goes back to yeah. uh, um, stoicism as well and memento mori. I mean, it, we could leave this earth at any time. And so if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, what is it that I would want to convey to my children and make sure that they, um, you, you know, because at 15 and 11, they're uh, not ready to hear some of this, you know, deep philosophical stuff right now, but at some point totally. they may want to hear that. And I, I hope I'm around to, to, you know, speak with them one-on-one, -on -one. but if I'm not, you know, some sort of a repository of the things that I've learned in my, you know, 39 odd years on the planet. Um, so that's been really top of mind for me. It was gonna, I, it, it seemed obvious that it was going to be a book. Um, but I just absolutely hate the process of writing. I, I go back through, sure. I edit again, I edit again, and I try to get it to, to perfect. And so even a blog post uh, takes me forever. So I was kind of um, 
yeah, trying to 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 find some other solution than than the uh, the written word and going the book route, and um, that's what's led me to considering doing a podcast of my own at some point, which hopefully right. will be kicking off uh, later this week. But um, yeah, as as you mentioned, they're they're really when I think about what I want to convey to my daughters, there's really two big themes, and you know I'm sure this will expand um, as I kind of go down my my rabbit hole uh, uh, with the podcast, but reading and the value of that. Cause I, I think I got yeah. so much out of that, um, which is just impossible to put uh, a tangible value on and then exercise and the value of those two things and incorporating yeah. those into your life and, and making them, uh, habitual. And, um, cause I, I mean, you only get one, one body and you know, they need to take, uh, I need to take care of myself. I neglected it for, for too long. I would love for my daughters to take care of their bodies and, um, you know, to be healthy and, and happy for uh, a long time. So we talk a lot about nutrition. We talk a lot about exercise, but again, you know, at their ages, they're um, not necessarily super excited to have those conversations. So, so documenting sure. the value of exercise. And then again, you know, my, I, I've actually incentivized them um, to go through my reading list and there's some Brilliant. books that would make sense now and there's other ones that, that aren't going to make sense at all because they're very business specific. But, um, you know, I'd love for them to read some of the same things that I did and ho hopefully yeah. it resonates with them in the way that it did with me. And, you know, whether it's um, I think there's a, a teenager version of the seven habits. So I, I've been sharing that with my 15 year old and then how to win friends and influence people when they're they're ready to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, ab absorb something along those lines. These are things that that I'm going to continue to try and hammer home and I think could be um, extremely beneficial to them leaving a, you know, long, joy filled, fulfilling life. So. Yeah. And you said you incentivized them. How? <laughs> so that I think, um, I was, I, th I think it was a hundred bucks for each book that they read awesome. on my reading list. So, I mean, I tried to make it lucrative and, um, yeah. so far she's only read one, which was the teenage version of the, the seven habits, highly affected people. But, um, you know, at some point she's, uh, I think she's going to want to buy something and, and the, the allure yep. of a hundred dollars might make it worth it. So, so we'll see if I deviate from that, but that's the plan for now. So totally. Um, if people wanted to, oh, I have one more thing for you. I, at the end of it, I like to do some kind of like a silly game. And so um, uh, the one that I have for you is called What's That Mean? Uh, and I'm just going to give you a word. It is a word that you very likely have not heard of because I haven't heard <laughs> of it either. It's a very weird English word. Um, if you've ever played like Balderdash where you just, you've got to make up a definition. Uh, just want you to make a definition that you think sounds believable for this. So the word is earth which is E-R-F, earth. What is the obvious definition of earth that you're going to convince us all of? Earth, huh? E-R-F. <laughs> For whatever reason, it seems like an animal to me. Uh, and it's like a platypus, platypus looking creature uh, in that, that, that same genus or species. Uh, yeah. it's a, so it's, it's a, it is a, uh, a variation of a platypus uh, called Earth. Obviously, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe I mean, that that you, guys gonna, yes. you guys are gonna you guys are gonna sell for for horses and Earths next, right? Yeah, yeah. Get a little halter, <laughs> like a like a a, a a leash, lead rope. Yeah, we can little platypus leash. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. If people wanted to follow you, if they wanted to connect, uh, if they wanted to work with you at traction capital, or if they want to follow your podcast, uh, what's the best way for them to stay in touch? So I have a personal website. It's Chris vision. And that actually has a link to that Yale white paper we mentioned earlier. And yep. then also my favorite books list that we talked about as well. Um, and then tractioncapital.com, if you're interested at all in uh, a venture investment or following the fund in the Twin Cities here. And then the podcast is called Leading to Legacy, and that is okay. on all of the socials. So uh, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. And then also leadingtolegacy.com is going to have uh, all of our podcast episodes as they're released. So. Awesome. I love it. Yes. Check it out. Chris has got a lot of wisdom to share. I'm excited to uh, be part of that. I think I got to hear just a little snippet of it uh, the other day. So it's going to be a pre <laughs> pretty good one. Chris, thank you for jumping on here, sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah. Thank you, man. It was, uh, it was a pleasure. I always love connecting with you. Likewise, everybody else. Thanks for uh, tuning in and uh, have a great rest of your day. 
Thanks for listening to the Up Arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.